So the topic of the talk is uh, formalizing DeFi property. I listened a little bit to your protocol. I don't know how to formalize it yet. Uh, I'm gonna try to talk about something simpler, which is uh, related to Sushi or Uniswap, but it has some of the ingredients that you talked about, not all of them. We can talk about it. Uh, our team is uh, growing. Uh, uh, basically, Shelly and me started the venture about uh, almost four years ago. Uh, it's a venture and we are now actually a sizable team, uh, about 65 people. Uh, many of us have background in this domain. Uh, I wanna point out the people who are here. I, I see at least Alec. I saw Eyal, oh, now I see Eyal and Michael was somewhere else. So these are the people who are here. Most of the other people are basically working uh, uh, on our tool and helping our customer. We are global, but we have a big, big location in, in Seattle, big location in Tel Aviv. We also have some people in Europe uh, and we are, we, are, we are hiring. We are interested in, in interns. We're interested in everything, not to take the people from BlockSwap, but uh, we are interested if you want, please approach me, or approach any other people. We, are, we want to build the technology that actually makes this uh, code secure. And we have built one tool that you can see in a demo. For the talk, I prepared actually, the team prepared the demo, and if you are bored, just go in the demo and show the examples. So these are the examples for specifically for this talk. So please try them out. Uh, I'm just uh, pointing out, uh, hi everyone. I'm pointing out the, the people who are sort of expert in this field. We have many people, but many of us have background in formal verification, have PhD. So these are people who study this topic and we are trying for us. I've been working on this domain for many years. As you can probably know, in the domain of formal verification, there's the, the highest number of two in the world and probably more are coming. So this means that the problem is not really solved. And we are trying to solve it in the specific case of, of blockchain or even we are even more specific at the moment we focus on DeFi. And there are some challenges, I will explain to you how we address them, but it's not by any mean the only way. Uh, what is the product which is available and you can try on the demo? There are more products that are coming, but I'm gonna talk only about the product which is available. Uh, so what it does, it analyzes your byte code. So you basically take the low level code, the code which is executed, and you run it through a code which we call static analysis or formal verification. And this is at the moment implemented on the cloud. And what it will do, it will show you some rules and it will show you which rules hold and which rules do not hold. And when a rule holds, it can actually give you a mathematical proof that it holds. And when the rule is violated, it will give you a test case indicating the error. You notice that this is a, the hardest problem in computer science. So basically, how can it be? Can you tell me? How can it be? How, how come the tool is doing it? And the tool is fully automatic. You've seen, uh, so the tool is, so how come the tool is doing it? So the truth is that I'm cheating. The idea is that there are some cases that the tool fails. If your code is too complicated, the tool will time out. Okay, and of course for us, so basically the tool actually, there are three outputs. They basically sometimes they give the rules, sometimes it gives you a counter example, but sometimes the tool is fail. And failure in this is, is, is actually doomed because there are some complicated uh, uh, issues related to mathematics that the tool will fail. And what we are doing when we are working with the customer, we are trying to make sure that the tool works. And this is done by improving the tool, improving our language, doing many things. But at the end of the day, if your code is too complex, the tool will fail. And one technique which is very, very useful, I won't be able to explain it, is modularity. If your code is modular, the formal verification is easier, whether you're using our tool or others. But unfortunately, many of the code that we analyze is not modular and we take all the customers that pay, okay? So, so, so basically, some of the tools, the tool fail. Uh, and the use case for this technology, and this is where we think this is the best use case of this technology, is during CI. So basically every time you change the code, you run the tool. And if the rules did not change, then in fact you are changing it. And we have already identified many, many bugs in protocols when the, when the code is changed. And this technology is complementary to auditing. You can audit the rules. For example, if the rules are not right, 
then an auditor can find it. And also, if there is a problem found by an auditor, we can add the rule, and then we can run the tool again, and basically show that at least next time the code is changed, this problem is not re reoccurring. Okay? So I have a question for you. I told you I will have questions. Some are easier than others. So this is the first question. Uh, we are in the Netherlands. And who is the most uh, famous Dutch uh, computer scientist? I don't have two of these. Yes? Dijkstra. Wonderful. Everybody knows. So Dijkstra is a, uh, I actually had the pleasure of interacting with him myself. He has one of the sort of smartest people in, in computer science, a genius on his own. Uh, and he actually started many of the things here. What did Dijkstra do? Somebody else. What did Dijkstra invent? Why is he famous for? He got a two in the world, but, well, uh, but what is he famous for? Yeah, no, not somebody else. It sounds like you. Nobody knows about Dijkstra? That's bad. You can Google him. Okay, no, the Everett knows, but he's uh, very shy to say. Uh, so Dijkstra invented many, many things, uh, but one of the things that uh, uh, he invented is the shortest pass algorithm. So that's an algorithm that computed the shortest pass. It's a very, very useful result. He also sort of laid the ground for what is called formal verification in the sense that he developed this idea of invariant, which is the purpose of this talk, sort of writing invariant about your code. So that's the thing, and he always said that you don't start writing the code before you start, you start writing the invariant. That's not, I think it's a bit unrealistic. So uh, this is Dijkstra. Uh, and he invented shortest path, thinking in terms of invariant, there are many things. Weakest precondition, actually, this is the technique which is implemented in the Sartor approver. I won't be able to explain to you, but it's the idea, you can think about it like a compiler that compiles your code into a formula. And essentially, this is what implemented in Sartor. Sartor is a complicated compiler. It compiles your code and specification into a mathematical formula, and this mathematical formula is solved by other solvers that sometimes succeed and sometimes fail. So when I told you that there is a failure, it's not actually a failure of Sartor. It's a failure of the underlying technology which is, which is used by Satora, okay? So Satora implements many things, but eventually it's, it comes to a, what is called SMT, is a constraint solver. Think of something like Mathematica. And the idea is that it actually used this, and this is used either to find bugs or to prove the apps. There is a quote by Dijkstra, which I personally don't like, but many, many people think about it. So basically Dijkstra was sort of, sort of opponent about you, saying that testing is not enough and you need formal verification. I would say it's the opposite, you need both, okay? You need formal verification, but you also need testing. And, and, and these are two complementary things. Testing is, we, I mean, we, we, there's a, the other quote by Knut that says that I haven't, I haven't run my program, I only formally verify that. That's not good either, okay? You need to do everything and that's what we are. So again, this is a very, very simple example to get you the idea of what's going on here. So. This is a code like money transfer. Again, not as complex as you have here. And the property that we want is to show that the sum of the balance before is equal to the sum of the balance after. What do you think? Is this code, can you, can you read it from here, from the back? Or can you read the code? Zero. So does this code, is this co code correct? That's a simple question, but uh, I, Everett knows, but some other people here, I want newcomers. So this, is this code correct? How many of you are, have coding back home? Maybe I'm a, uh, uh, can you raise, how many of you have, co oh, so most of you don't have coding back home. Okay, so, so, so is this code correct? Uh, looks okay. Looks okay, okay, that's actually, that's the beauty, that's the beauty of it. That most of the bugs that we found are in code that looks okay, okay, and that's the, the beauty of it. So this code is looks okay, it has an edge case, it's not very interesting edge case, but the idea is if the number is too high, you have an overflow. And, and you, can, you can avoid it by using Solidity point eight or, 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 or basically or, or, uh, open Zeppelin uh, safe mass. Exactly, wonderful. What about this other tool, the other code here? This is a variant of this code. It's, it's a variant of this code. I'm sorry for the ones which are not code there, but it's that like basically pieces of lines of code. You can think about, I don't know, like a re recipe of cooking, if you think, I don't know. This is, this is something like you are doing something. 
And there is one step and a step, a step, a step, and each step is doing something. And the, the idea is that most code is correct, but there are edge cases. And somebody, the, the worst case of a blockchain, when you have edge cases, somebody exploit them, okay? So here there is, a, sorry? Always, exactly. So this is an edge case, I think it's something like 600 million. It's not bad, actually, okay? So, 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 okay? So, the, by, so, so uh, what's the edge case here? Can somebody guess? The, the, there is an edge case here. The, there's more interesting edge case than the, than the overflow here. What's the edge case here? Justine, you want to help? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And many tools can, can find these kind of bugs, but our tool is not actually looking for this specific bug. It's looking for violation of your specification. So we are finding these bugs, but we are finding more interesting one that I'll be able to show you, okay? So this is actually a bug that we'll find. The tool will look for the rule, and it will use this constraint solver, and the constraint solver will give you, this, if from is equal Alice and two is equal Alice, then you are doing this self-operation and you are gaining money on, on, and this is actually something that is found by the tool. And it's not by looking for this kind of error, it's by comparing the, beha the two behaviors. So this is the bug, and if you fix it, of course, we can show that it's correct. So what actually is the Sertora prover? So if you guys are coder, one of the things that we know very much in coding is a program called diff. So this program called diff, it compares two programs. And it tells you it's a textual comparison. It can say which lines here are comparison to here. This is a diff, but it's another level of diff. The idea is what happened is that you compare the program to a specification. And you are checking for behaviors of the program which violate your specification, okay? So either you find such, for such things and these are bugs, or you prove that they are not there and it means your specification is met, okay? And this tool may fail, it means that sometimes the tool will not actually be able to answer. But the tool can give you a decisive answer, either yes, no, or, or, or it sometimes fails, okay? So far, so good. Uh, yes, and it can, so what's the, yeah, you wanna ask? Okay, so what is actually enabling it? Uh, this would be uh, even more technical for people who are not coder. There's a lot of things that we have implemented, and this is actually showing you the flowchart of the tool. So basically the tool has, uh, I told you that it's actually generating a constraint. So this is basically the vanilla solution, but we have a more clever solution. We are trying to actually do some kind of things under the hood, so we actually avoid some of the problem. For example, memory problem. So there's a clever static analysis, there is a decompiler. So from the bytecode, we actually reach something much higher level and we reason about it. And this is done automatically. It has some limits, but it is done automatically. So the human is not in the loop here. Okay, so this is automatically. And at the moment, it's only for EVM, but we can probably implement it for WebAssembly, eBPF, or other things. And this is basically, eventually, it reached the constraint solver, and the constraint solver either finds a model, this is what is called SMT, SAT modulo theory. Questions so far? Okay, yes. Uh, you, can you come to the, to the, yeah. So I have a qu general question uh, regarding your, like the second or third slide that you said you need both, that, uh, both testing and formal verification. But can you like expand more about the testing part? Because in my, like in my view, if I can check the, function for all possible inputs, why would I check it for a, another time for a specific input, which is already contained in the set of all possible inputs? Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So, so the question uh, is, why do you need testing as opposed to, uh, in addition to formal uh, verification? So the, the obvious answer is that there might be failure of the tool. For example, if the tool time out, then you need testing. Another question, and that's a, a more likely question, Many times, it's not actually a failure of the tool, it's the failure of the human writing the specification. And in the process of testing, you test the code and you eyeball it and you look at the behavior, human, I'm, I'm not talking about automatic testing, I'm talking about the testing performed by a human. The human is running the code and is looking for behavior. And this is sort of the comparison. Our tool is automatic. This has certain advantages, but it has certain disadvantages. If I wrote, I can show you, I can tell you that we have one client that use our technology in addition to auditing. And, and the auditing were very good, and the tool worked very good. But somebody found a bug after him because his environment was not the right one. Okay, so, so the, and this is can happen, of course. We are building tools and we are building technology actually that checks the environment 
which will be available. We are also building a tool, tool, uh, tool which generates test cases automatically from the rules, which will also be available. So we are building more things, but at the end of the day, the human and the computer is, 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 is aligned, and we need both. And the thing that the auditor can do for us, and they already have a company called Change Security, they are auditing our rules. So that's a great idea, sort of looking into our rules, and our rules are all open. So people are reading these rules and see what have we verified so that they can check it. And we want to do a bug bounty for rules and everything because this is part of the things. If the rules are not right, it doesn't matter. And I'll show you more complex rules where we go. And you see that some of these rules are fairly complex. Okay, good. So what is the underlying technology uh, in, 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 a, in a sort of a one slide? The idea is the program has many passes. And here you see a program uh, I don't know how to point here. There is like, uh, the program is, is, uh, is uh, written from left to right. Sorry for this, how it fits the slide. But the idea is that you see there are branches in your program, and eventually there is some kind of assertion. And you want to know if this assertion holds. And in this, in this, in this program, there are many, many passes. And the question is, how do we enumerate the passes? In fact, we go into some program that has infinite number of passes because they are integers and they are everything. So the answer is that we don't explicitly enumerate. We generate a formula, and this formula captures the behavior of the program. So this is what's going up here. You see that we are generating a formula, and then we are using a solver, and the solver solves the formula. So in this case, the solver actually found the path that leads to the error. So the, the solver is finding the edge case for you, okay? And when you are correcting the program, then the solver is actually able to tell you what is called unsat. It means that this, this formula is not satisfiable. So the problem, the solver is, is able to generate a mathematical proof that all passes are good, but the solver is not explicitly enumerating all behaviors. It's important, and it's not possible to enumerate all behaviors. So that's why we are getting this kind of high guarantee. Uh, so we, we have been uh, working for many, many clients. I think we are very proud of the fact that how much the, use the tool is used. Is used. So that's basically it's used on the CI. I'm talking about not the use in the demo. I'm talking about used by real customer. We are obviously very, very proud of the money that we are protecting. It doesn't mean that this money, but this is code that we have formally verified some properties, not all properties. And it's, it is not the whole amount, but it's significant amount. I, I don't know if I got it from DeFi pools, and it's got, uh, but it is a significant amount. Ideally, we want to secure everything there's some limits of our technology, but this is where we, we are hoping to get. Uh, we are analyzing pretty huge number of lines, uh, and maybe that's the most important thing, and that's how we evaluate the service, how many bugs we are finding, and how many bugs we are preventing. And we are finding this bug before the code is deployed. We can also run the code after the code is deployed, but that's le less interesting for us because we don't know actually how to communicate. So the idea is this tool can be run on the executable code, so, but we, we are finding this code and we, we are reporting it to our customer before the code is deployed. Okay, so I wanna uh, uh, show you, go to show you some invariant. So no, the, now I have to show you some code, but it's not as complex code as the code you've seen. It's a simple code, and it's a code that probably many people know. Uh, it's a, I call it sushi, but it's actually also in Uniswap. The idea is you have two tokens, and, and you, are, you are maintaining an environment that the, the, the multiplication, the product is constant. So here you see you have 50 and 200. And suppose you are buying uh, 50 token, 50 token. Then how many tokens do you need to give back? You are buying 50 tokens. How many tokens do you need to give back? That's actually a question not just for coders. That's a question for people are working in economy, so more people can answer me. Okay? Okay, can we do it slowly? So basic, sorry? No, okay, so let's do it slowly, more slowly. Let's do it slowly. I'm also not, not very good at that. I'm, uh, I'm not a DeFi expert. I, I learned to be DeFi late, so let's do it slowly. So first, we see that after you bought 50, then you have 150 and 66, and the product remains the same, it's 10,000. So the question is, now it's clear how much we have to give back. You see, you have the, this on the slide. How much do you have to give back? 
16, okay, 16. So you have to give big 16. And this is how this code is, is implemented. For example, Sushi or Uniswap, this is how we implement it. It's implemented in a way that you, 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 you provide and you give back. And that's actually this kind of constant pool. It's implemented in, in, in Uniswap, it's implemented in other things. It gets more complicated when you are providing new, op new, new operations, okay? So one interesting operation is investment because investment has to do with the number of shares. Okay, here for example, you are investing 40, uh, 10, 10 A token and 40 B token. Yes. Yeah. Can you, can you come to the... As you mentioned, we are here trying to make the constant product formula again equal. And in the beginning, you have 50 times 200, which is 10,000, obviously. And then you have 66 times 150, which is actually 9,900. So I was wondering, why is that? Yeah. <laughs> sure. You see that you are listening, okay. Okay, good. So so then uh, the question is what happened? Sorry, thanks. So it seems like you are listening. That's great, <laughs> okay. So, but you get, you, you see, you get the idea. I get it wrong. Of course, I, I don't write code. I only write PowerPoint. <laughs> and even that, I, <laughs> even, and even that I get wrong, okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, okay, but uh, the, it gets even more complex when you want to invest. Uh, because, of course, when you invest, you change the product, okay? So you, you are changing the product, and the idea is there are these LP shares. For example, here there's 100, and the, the ratio is 100 to 50, 1 to 2, to 2. So you need to maintain the same ratio. I, again, I'm not an economic, but this is basically a, a reasonable economic rule. So we, we, we keep it apart. We have these 20. So it's basically now we change it. Now you see the product is 40, and 40 but we maintain the fact that the, the, the rule is the same, that the share, the share value is the same. So this is, actually these are not just DeFi, these are normal financial rules, I should say, but they're enforced in DeFi, okay? And maybe the, the thing which is even more tricky, it sounds like actually it's similar to what you are doing from what I could understand, there is also operation called burn. So there is an operation. I don't know you. I don't know if I got it right, but you have a, something like to to burn, no? Yeah, yeah. So 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 y you can interrupt me. You. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this this where things can really get get bad. Okay. But that's a very powerful operation. The idea is I can burn my money. Okay, so I burn this 20 token. Okay, and then you see how it's gone. So this is burning your money. Now it's, it's actually more, so basically you go out. It's somehow the, the inverse of investment, but the idea is you're burning single. You're burning one token. So this is how DeFi is implemented and, uh, and, and, and we come from in this domain for formal verification. And what we want to do, we want to make sure that the code does what it's supposed to do. Okay, and for us there are two uh, phases. One is that we write the specification, which is a very hard thing, and the other one we get the tool to work, which is also a hard thing. Okay, and I'm gonna talk to you mainly about the first one, but the second one is sort of in our tool. Okay, so I wanna ask you a question, but it sounds like maybe it's very tricky, it was very tricky for me. What is actually the property of this protocol? So I will, I will uh, say that first property that we are care about, is that the, 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 the multiplication of the token is the square of the shares. So that's a, a very simple economical property. Another property which is related but not exactly the same is that the property that if one of them is zero, if and only if the other one is zero. So they, they basically cannot, and that's a very interesting property to maintain. Okay, so this is what we do in Sertora. We write all of these rules we have our own language called CVL, for lack of a better name, Sertora Verification Language. 
And this basically, it's a domain-specific language for writing properties. And we want to lang this language to look like solidity, but it's very, very far from solidity in the sense that it's actually talking about your properties and not about your code, okay? And it's something that you write in a, se in in a separate file, and you write this property that you have, okay? So, for example, this is integrity of swap. You can write it as mathematician write is what's called whole logic by Tony Hall. It basically says this is the assumption. You can think about it like it requires in solidity, and this is the assert. And in the middle, you have the code. And in Sertoa language, we have something which is called rule, and it's essentially the same thing. There is this setup, and then there are these rules, and you can call function. It's almost like you are, you, are, you, are, you are writing your program twice, but it's not the case. You are writing these high-level properties of your program that you are ensuring, okay? So uh, this simple rule actually already captures a bug in, in, a, in a protocol before it was uh, deployed called Badger. The idea is that they swap the parameters, they didn't use the parameters in the right way, and the tool actually found the bug before the code is deployed. So that's a very, very good use case of this technology, that we are finding these bugs before the code is deployed. And there it's clear that once we are finding these bugs, you don't actually need to trust the tool. You'll see these bugs and you can run it and check. Uh, we actually support a lot of powerful things. I don't know if you guys not coming from the field, but the idea is that you actually call, you see this is called parameterized whole logic, it doesn't matter, but the idea is you are calling a function that you don't know which function it is. And the tool is like a query language. The tool will enumerate all function and check. For example, here you are checking that you cannot burn something for somebody else. So you cannot change the, the, the amount of somebody else. So we have these rules that we are checking. And these high-level rules, they are nice because they are rules that you can almost integrate between different DeFi. You can actually, we have seen that the different DeFi, so there is some kind of a network effect. You can take the code and check. So there is this network effect that you can check between the different protocols. Uh, uh, and, and this actually caught a very nice bug in SUSY swap before it was deployed. So this is actually the idea is that in the blockchain, people sometimes confuse and they don't use the message sender in the right way. So basically there is a receipt instead of message sender and the tool found it, but the tool is not looking for some kind of behavior. The tool compares the program to the, to the, to the specification and find this bug for you. Uh, I want to actually, uh, leave some time for questions. So I want to actually show you a, a, a sort of a, one of the most beautiful bug the tool found, which is very, very uh, nice to see. So unfortunately for people who are not coders, it's, it will be a bit hard, but I will try. So the idea is that, a, what is a beautiful bug? A beautiful bug is something which is surprising, okay? A beautiful bug is something that the specification is very simple. If the specification just say this is, and, 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 and it's actually something that many, many people miss, okay? So this is the case here. So this is Trident. I don't know if how many you, you know. Trident is one of the newest sort of sushi uh, thing coming. Uh, and it's essentially a, a constant pool. And you see the, the environment that we have is exactly the same environment that we said earlier, a bit more complicated. It says it's a total supply. So think of total supply as the multiplication of the token. And the idea is total supply is zero if and only if uh, uh, one of them is zero, so if only if, if reserve A and also if and only if reserve B. So the idea is basically that they're, all, they're either both zero or neither zero. Okay, that's basically what this rule is saying. And this is a very, very simple rule. If you ask economists, every economist will tell you this is the rule. Okay, so you don't need actually to be sort of even not a coder. It's true, you, can, you need to write it in our language, but you see that our language is not so bad. It's a, at least for here, it's very, very concise. Okay, and you want to guess what happened when this rule said? It will give you an example that you can drain the pool completely. It will give you run the tool and it will give you a counter example that we ca you can drain the tool. So let me show you. So basically, you write this simple environment and the, tool, the rule, so let's see what happened. So this is, by the way, the code, or it's a simplified version of the code. There is a problem of how uh, the code is written. You can check. It's also, by the way, all of it is available from the demo side. Uh, but let me, oh, this color is not, uh, but, uh, yeah, the color is not working well. Can you read here? Uh, it's hard for me, but you, yeah. Okay, 
So this basically, you have token A, you token B, and you have a lot of liquidity, okay? And you can execute operation here. And each operation changes the, the liquidity and, and, and change the token A and token B. So one operation that you can do is external transfer. What external transfer does, you buy more token A. Okay, you buy more token A, you increase the liquidity, that's all great. Okay, so far you see that our invariant holds. Our invariant holds because it seems that both of them are not zero. Okay, so our invariant holds. And now you are doing band single. Because you have so many tokens, you can actually make, because you, you have so many A tokens, you can, and that's of course a bug in the code. It shouldn't be allowed, and it wasn't allowed when the code was deployed. I say, we found this bug before the code was deployed, luckily, okay? So what happened is that we, we the, it will give you, the, the token can go to zero, and now the token is zero, so what can you do? Do you know what you can do? But you have to understand a little bit about, so what can you do when one of the token is zero? So the, now the environment is broken, but so far it doesn't look bad. When people say, so what? The environment is broken, but what can you do when one of them is zero? Okay, so one of the token is zero and the other one is not zero. And how can you drain the pool? What do you do? Yeah, but how? What operation you execute? Exactly, wonderful. You swap, <laughs> and then the money is gone. Everybody is, uh, yeah, the money is gone. It's. I think it's something like few billions. It's gone. <laughs> okay. Right? No? How much is in there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's, but it's not, sorry? So, so that's the problem. The, the band single, the band single, uh, uh, where was it? The, the band single uh, uh, had a bug that actually prevented this. That it has it. Okay, so there was a bug in the code. This was a coding overflow. This is uh, people are human, okay? Uh, uh, so basically, there was a coding error, and the code error prevented that. Uh, it caused that. And of course, once we fix that, we ran the rule. We don't know still that the code is correct. I don't want to tell you that we know, but we know that at least this environment maintained. Okay, that's what we are doing. We know how to prove you that the environment that none of them. So basically, they are both zero, and that's what we prove. Okay, and sometimes we prove on the real code. And sometimes we have to simplify the code because of things. In this case, we are lucky. We were able to prove it on the real code, okay? The, the code itself is not actually very big. All the code is available, and all the code actually that I showed you here, including the demo, it's all available in the demo. You can try it, you can change. This is the idea. Okay, I'm almost running out of time, but I needed to show ghost for you. Just a second. Uh, uh, okay, where, wait a second. So uh, this I, I skipped. Uh, it's basically explaining you the connection between invariant and rules, but it's very technical. I, I don't explain relational property. Uh, this is something else in the tool. Uh, I want to exp uh, no, I only want to explain ghost, okay? Because this is something that is going to be used. So one of the problem in the the tool is uh, rely on constraint solvers, and constraint solver they are using something in which is called first order logic. It's very technical, but some things are not expressible in to in this logic. So our way around it, we have ghost. The idea is the human can, you can think about it like a database. The human can find some, define some properties that it's it called ghost. For example, here, there is this address, and each address has the balance. And there is a ghost which maintains the sum of the balance. And this is automatically updated. And then the code, we can do that. So basically, this is automatically updated. So in the code, for example, when balance is changed, then the, the, the code updated the total. Okay, and this is something that we, we do. So this is, you see, our own language. It's a, it's a bit ugly, but this is how we do it. We basically uh, have some idea that you define a ghost, and you define ghost on the code, and you basically, there is some mechanism where, we, since we operate on the bytecode, we actually say which operation on the bytecode, how it changes the ghost. And of course, we have underlying static analysis that makes sure that we don't do terrible mistakes. But still, this ghost code is not actually checked. We only check the environment with respect to the ghost. Uh, so this is uh, what I want to show. Uh, I want to just uh, two or three minutes uh, capture some things. I've worked in this field for many <coughs> years, and I think that's important for people outside the field. So in many fields, including uh, formal verification, which is well understood, there's a lot of mist. And the biggest myth, going back to Rice theorem and other, that formal verification is a hard computation, uh, sorry, 
The biggest miss is formal verification is for finding proofs. But the biggest value for formal verification, and this was shown for ho hardware, is finding bugs, okay? So we are very, very happy from the tool when the tool finds bugs. When the tool finds proofs, that's of course very useful, but it's up to our rules. And our tool, and we are building more tools, we want to find more and more bugs before the code is deployed. The second thing is that people think that the hardest problem in, in, in uh, formal verification is computational. It's go back to Rice and others, and uh, basically saying that the problem is very hard. A, and it's, it is, of course, true. The problem, the hard, the, it's very hard to mathematically prove that your code is right. But I we think it's equally hard to say what is right, to say the specification. And this is where we are working with you guys to, to make things work. Uh, all of these other things, uh, I'll go, it's too technical. Uh, I want to go bas basically to finish out to say the takeaway from here is that specification for DeFi are interesting. We have in our own language a lot of mechanism to, to specify that I wasn't able to, to, to cover all of them, but this is the idea. And we are developing technology. Uh, uh, I guess uh, Alex will talk uh, later this week about the technology. I haven't been talking about the technology here. So thank you for your time. I love to take questions. Yes. Yeah. Come to the. Okay. So let's imagine the following scenario. I have a company and I built something really cool and I come to you guys and I want to get it tested. We work with you. We develop tests. We write everything, the code. We get the formal proof that it has no bugs. Uh, after it happens, can you guys provide some sort of certification that is like public credible that can be used to kind of accreditate? what has been created? Thank you very much, an excellent question. So the question is, what can we provide when we work? So we, we have two type of uh, customers, uh, customers who, who are working with us that we write verification report, and customers that work alone, and we provide certification for both. We help you review the rules because at the end of the day we are together. And basically what we usually try to be in this domain, which so far has been working well, is to be transparent. So we are basically going to tell you what we verified, what are the limitations. We just want to be transparent. That's the only f way we can do. And we can tell you this is a failure of our tool. So that's what we do. We, and of course, we, when we work, we, always, we, we are formally verifying, but we're also carefully reviewing the code. It's not really the case. So we are, so because we are really afraid of a problem. And, and what happened to us, for example, I can give you a very interesting example. The first customer that we work with is actually Compact. Compound is a lovely team. And they work with us, and they, they work with us after they completed an auditing by one of the best auditors. You can find out. And they, found they finished the, the auditing with the first auditor, and then they told us if we can run our tool. But they said, don't need it, because it was done by such a good auditor, your tool will not find anything. And we ran the tool. Of course, the tool found something. We did not trust our tool, OK? <laughs> But then we said it's worth what to take, which we, we showed them the problem. This was a real error, okay? So, and, and, and basically, after, after, after they deployed, we only <laughs> analyzed on one code, but somebody else found a bug in the code that we didn't run, okay? So, so, and what we did for them, which I think we can do for many others, we basically, when they rewrite the code, we check it because we have this fully technology, so we, in fact, we check it. So we basically, and we do it with other customers. So basically, after the code is, is broken, we will use, this as a technology, this technology can find equivalent between two programs. So if you want, when you, when you change your code, we will work with you to make sure that at least you not insert new bug and you fix the bug what was there. So we see this project, uh, uh, relationship as a continuous. It's not a one time. And we want to work with you and we will report everything we find. And of course you can uh, generate mathematical proof, they are huge. I don't know how comprehensible the proof. There may be the proof that you are generating from K, they are more pretty. But the proof that we are getting from an SMT solver, in my experience, they are not pretty at all. And, 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 and they are not actually verifying everything because in, the, in the our tool, we are converting the code for a formula and maybe there is a bug in our own tool. So there, there can be, of course, many bugs, including our own tool. Okay, we, do, we, don't, check, we don't tell you, so, so I don't know if I answer your question.
So my last question is, uh, I think the concept is great and it would be awesome if you could integrate it with some sort of like continuous integration pipeline. So for example, a developer pushes code to let's say GitHub or Azure DevOps or whatever. Is there some integration that can use this software to like automatically run those proofs and tests on the code? That's a very, very good thing. So uh, we have integrated with, uh, uh, I'm not a technical guy, but I think we integrated with with uh, Circle, with JIT, right, uh, Alex, you, you uh, yeah, so we have integration with many of the existing tools, and we want to integrate with all. We're also integrating with VS Code. We're also integrating with Foundry. We want to integrate with all the tools here. We want to make this tool seemingly integrate with everything in the environment, and uh, yes, we want to do that, and uh, it's in the process. I don't know exactly what is in, but uh, everything is, yes, we want to make this tool so it's integrated into your, into your build. And there are companies like, for example, Syndicate is part of the pipeline, and we love it, Compound and whatever. We love for everybody to be in part of the pipeline. And maybe just a quick announcement, if you guys are interested, we have actually signed, I don't know if you've seen, a, a large agreement with the Aave community, and we're looking for people to contribute rules for Aave, and there we are giving free keys. It's basically, you can access it and check the correctness of Aave, and then you will write rule. Also, of course, you're gonna pay be paid for writing rules, and I told you that writing specification is hard, but we pay a lot. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a good job. If you are a mathematician, if you understand finance, you, this is a good job to do. Thanks. We want to bring up Ethereum at two o'clock. So we'll, uh, I'll, g I'll get started. I'll get started whilst people are going. So, um, Continuing on from uh, Muli, who introduced the tool, uh, we want to the Sortora tool. We want to show how we're using the Sortora tool to uh, actually secure and improve our smart contract development. So, pardon. Uh, well, I think people are. Yeah, people are. Yeah, yeah. I think people are are gone. Okay. All right, all right. So, so it's our tool. So, so you know, just a bit about why we're using it. We so the so Blockstop has a as a goal to to become the, the you know the best uh, smart contracting uh, company in the in the multi chain industry, and that requires a an, an a, you know a multi pronged approach uh, to security. We we have a very security first. Um, uh, mindset, everything, you know, security is, is the most important thing above all, like above launching, rushing to launch a protocol or, you know, getting it out the door, we, you know, we want to make sure that the security of the protocol is preserved and, and, and uh, as good as we can possibly want. So um, that involves using uh, Satoru's tool as well as doing auditing, uh, you know, fuzzing, um, simulations, um, and, and, and many other things. So, um, you know, we, the goal is to ensure user safety at, 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 at all times. In, in practice, um, you know, it's about writing specifications. So we, we, have, uh, we have a very in-depth uh, understanding of the protocol design, um, what properties the system should exhibit, um, and, you know, what invariants and, and ghosts that, that, that are really important to the, uh, to the protocol. We write that in Sotora's uh, CVR language um, in order to model this design and then have the tool automatically tell us whether or not uh, it knows whether the, the, uh, the specifications meet the, uh, so, sorry, the, whether the, the implementation meets the design as, as, as specified in the rules and, and, and invariants and properties. So, for example, for every 32 ETH, um, that is that is sent to the deposit contract for every uh, new validator that is registered. When the minting of derivatives happen, the issuance happens that the user gets exactly 24 DETH and eight slot token. That that issuance policy is m is exact, and it's you know it's a batch just like a 32 ETH is a, is a, is a fixed batch. Uh, every new validator 32, 32, 32. In our case, in our system, a, a behavior and a property that we can say about the system is that it must issue you know exactly 24 ETH and eight slots. I start with that as a nice, interesting, like simple property that the system has, um, because uh, as I previously said before, issuance and redemption of 
uh, the derivatives are, are, are very important. So we, we want to make sure that that, that is preserved and, uh, and exactly correct. So um, uh, you can see, so this is a, a, a design that, uh, sorry, a, um, a diagram that I stole from Sertora. It's a, it's a common one. You know, the, the tool is taking these properties, uh, matching it against the implementation, and, and then giving you a, an outcome. Sometimes it's not sure. Sometimes it says, you know, something failed, and it will give you a counterexample and say, look, you know, you do this deposit or you do, uh, you call this smart contract with these inputs, this is what you're going to get. You're going to have problems. Um, so it's, you know, it, it, it helps us to identify some really interesting things uh, and properties uh, and, and, and things that, that need fixing. Um, on a more complicated level, so with the lunch and build, we showed um, and, and spoke about the SaveEth registry and how you can have these index of, of validators that, that have, so you have these batches of, of DE that you can put in an index. You can have as many validators as you want, you can own it. Um, and, and, but each validator has an individual balance, just like when you go to the beacon chain and you take a BLS public key from a validator that's registered and you go to the beacon chain and you ask about the balance, each validator has its own balance. So each validator in the protocol also has its own balance and that, that changes based on the performance of the validator. But, um, Fundamentally, what's important to us is that the sum of the individual balances don't exceed the total de ETH in cir circulation. So uh, when so that we, we want to make sure that the accounting in the registry is correct. Um, that um, uh, like as, as it says on there, so the the, the sum of individual knots, uh, not balances in in uh, in the index, um, uh, it doesn't exceed what what has been minted. You know, just like. Uh, you know, in the example where, uh, you know, if, it, uh, if there's an, a, a poor implementation of an ERC-20 being used and this is not preserved, you know, some users will have more balance than, than the, uh, the total supply actually minted to users. So that would, be, that would be very problematic and it would put users' funds at risk. So we have, uh, we have this ghost that hooks into the, the storage uh, of the smart contract every time the registry updates uh, or, or records a new um, uh, validator. Uh, we want to make sure that that's correctly being stored, and we can we can go into like I can show you the uh, the actual sort of um, code. So if I just switch to that, right. So so this is a more advanced version of what um, Muli was showing in his previous talk. He showed a a, a ghost which is uh, tracking the balances of individual users in a, in an ERC twenty. This instead is tracking the individual balances of uh, knots in the save earth registry and it's basically summing up all those individual balances and making sure that it doesn't exceed a given ceiling. So um, you can see uh, if, I, if I highlight this uh, SS store, so this is if you understand uh, a little bit about the EVM and the storage opcode, this is hooking into literally the, the EVM opcode. And every time the, the storage is triggered, it's going to update the, the individual user balance and then the sum. So it's going through and saying, okay, boom, 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 boom. These all add up to 100. And, and, and 100 was issued, so that's, that's great. No, you know, we're happy. But if an individual balance deviated, then this tool would, uh, you know, because of implementation logic, this, this tool would tell us instantly. So we have, um, and this is very, very powerful. Now you can, you can do this with a unit test. Uh, it's a little bit more tricky. Right, right. This leads me on to my next po yeah, point about uh, so, so Toro versus unit test. Like you can't, you shouldn't have one or the other. Like you should have uh, as much uh, as much uh, testing as possible. But you know the difference between what you just saw and a unit test is in a unit test I can craft a specific scenario. So I can say, um, you know, uh, the if you y there's a specific scenario, the sun is out, uh, you're walking down the street. You know, such and such is happening. It's just, it's a handcrafted scenario, and it's checking values under that specific scenario. Uh, the ghost is saying, whenever the storage changes, and that can change, and that can change a lot. You know, uh, the tool just runs multiple times, and it uh, it gives you a huge level of coverage over many, many different scenarios, rather than one specific handcrafted uh, scenario. So both are good, and they complement each other uh, each other because the unit test you can do specific edge cases, but this is going this is this is more broad and giving you uh, a big overview across the contract, across all logic executed in the contract. It you know cannot find a way where it can manipulate an individual user balance to more than the supply. Like you know, for example, uh, let's say it correctly issues the batches, um, so it does 24 and 8 each time. But maybe 
every time you transfer it to another user, maybe it manipulates the balance in the wrong way. Now all of a sudden you have uh, more D th th than you should, right? That's a, that's a bad um, that's a bad situation to be in. So the tool is going and saying, and, and I can I can no matter what code I'm running, no matter what inputs I, I give you. Um, I can't find a situation where you can violate that that rule, and that's an important behavior and, and uh, sorry, ghost of the system. Um, um, so the other thing is that about the Sortura tool to to bear in mind is that uh, so it's calling uh, smart contract functions with arbitrary input, um, which is which is cool. So you can have fuzzers that do that, but the Sortura tool is also uh, starting the smart contract with arbitrary state. So uh, to put this in perspective, um, with a unit test, um, a unit test will deploy your smart contracts for you and then run your handcrafted scenario. So you start with like, when you're deploying in a unit test a smart contract for the first time, your token balances will be zero, right? There's no DETH in supply, no slot in supply. Then you do a deposit and now you have 24 and eight, so that's cool. But Sotoro will, will start you like with a supply of 50,000 DETH and it will say, okay, well now when I when you have 50,000.1, you know, blah, 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 uh, and I do this operation, ah, I found a problem, right? So it's kind of like it goes forwards, backwards in time and it, it starts in this arbitrary state that you, you can't predict, but it will tell you if there's a problem. Um, which, I, which I think is quite interesting. And, and again, you have this coverage aspect. You can write really concise rules that would take you hundreds and hundreds of lines to write um, in, as a unit test. So you can, you can achieve coverage in, in, in a very concise manner just by defining the behaviors of your system. How is your system supposed to behave? Um, but we, um, you know, there's a number of challenges that, that we have to face along the way. So um, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just go to this. So, um, VLS public keys, validator public keys are not native to Solidity. So if you're a Solidity developer, um, uh, it, it doesn't know anything about VLS public keys. It's, 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 not a, it's not something you can, just, you can just specify in the contract. So um, you have to get really, really low level. You have to specify uh, bytes as a, as a VLS public key. This is what the Ethereum deposit contract does. Um, and um, you know, it's more a point about like you know, if you're looking to build on you know on top of Ethereum staking, you're going to have to in your smart contracts deal with these bytes types. How are you going to verify your protocols are going to operate correctly? Um, you know, and, and 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 those sorts of things, right? We, this is a registry tracking ETH deposits, so somehow we have to process that. And 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 you know, this call, you know, this this introduced some challenges. <laughs> Right. So, so, so the Ethereum deposit contract, yeah, it uses the the bytes, and you can you can if you know how to track, uh, yeah, the Ethereum deposit contract, and you understand how to process the bytes, then you can convert it into a BLS public key. But it's it's a bit of a foreign concept, you know, an alien concept to um, to a lot of Solidity developers. But that's going to change a lot as more and more, uh, you know, the focus shifts to uh, putting ETH to work, you know, and building on top of um, you know uh, a, a protocol like the Stakehouse protocol, where you're you know you have this programmable yield layer, you have to understand the bytes and the complexity that, that comes with it. Uh, for example, Solidity, you know, uh, well, uh, the, to the EVM, the bytes is like an unbound type. So you could be, it could be as, as, as long or as short as you want it to be. And that causes problems for things like a, a tool that's trying to convert your code into a formula, if, you know, like this or a tool. So you're trying to you're trying to reason about something that's unbounded. So you're, the bytes or a string, you can have as long uh, of bytes or uh, uh, a string as you want. Um, and mathematically speaking, you, you know, some, at some point you have to like define some limits in order to prove whether your system works or not. So, so you have to say to the Sortura tool, well, uh, you know, for example, uh, a BLS public key is, is 48 characters. So when you're dealing with it, just deal with that. That's all you have to deal with. You don't have to worry about, oh, if the key is like 500 uh, characters or, you know, you don't have to. So we have to come across, we came across all these challenges, um, you know, went deep into the EVM, deep into the Ethereum consensus layer. We, we tore apart the uh, deposit contract. Um, and we've got like a really, really solid understanding of uh, the intricacies of the moving pieces in 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 uh, on both the execution layer and the the beacon chain layer, um, and how that's going to keep users' funds safe. That's the most important thing, right? That's why we're doing this. Why we're you know we we spent 
Um, you know, protocol has been uh, d in design phase for, for years, uh, development for a while. This is not like a protocol that's been thought about overnight. This has been, you know, there's been a, a lot of hard work put in by the team to get to this point. Um, and, 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 and we take, like I say, security seriously. So we, we're using all these tools to, um, uh, so as I'm saying on the, on the, on the slides, we, uh, through the auditing and this, using the Satora tool, we're fixing bugs, we're simplifying the code, and we love that. We absolutely love that. If we can, if we can cut down lines of code to a simpler, oh, Justin's smiling because he's been through the process of, right, let's make this simpler, right? Let's, let's simplify it, right? Because simplicity, um, y things, things are much more clear. When you can see the wood for the trees and you've got less clutter, less unnecessary code, you can reason about your code more, and you can, it's more maintainable, hopefully less bugs, you know, et cetera. So. One thing to do this is like, we have the complexity to code um, the bugs, the issue with the phone call, and exploit, and so on, like, you just went out and whatever. They're looking at the bugs from the events, right? And they're just getting mismatched. So the radio's gonna do it. But if the contract design can be verified and make it very simplistic and give to you, Preserved, you don't really have that kind of problem, even if the um, you know if there is some kind of issues on the other chain. So cross chain is always a very very difficult area where you are talking to, let's say you're talking to someone in Mars, right? It's totally different universe, two different universes, and you need to have some kind of language that where you can give the asset and the asset um, amount and the properties and everything can be very on the fly. And that can be done at the base level. And if you, if you make that simplified as you know, uh, Winston saying, and we, we can make it deterministically verifiable, then that's more effective. And when we do that, as a bifactor, the code will become very simple. So the code will only become simple when you actually start to remove complexities. But, uh, and that's a process that we sorry to mention. <laughs> Uh -huh. So, so messaging relay, yeah, yeah, spoofing, yeah. Okay, so I'll try and uh, just. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, we hope so. <laughs> so the the question was about. Um, so we just referencing wormhole. Um, uh, the 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 solidity did what it was asked to do. It was asked to release funds, um, and uh, and 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 Weth was released. So the the hacker walked away, and they kept their synthetics on the on the Solana side. Um, so you know what are we what are we doing from a um, you know Satora perspective or a testing perspective really? Um, so. We, as Matt said, we operate on uh, deterministic guarantees. We don't, uh, so the, the protocol is nat naturally async because you have um, stuff happening on the beacon chain, you have stuff happening on the execution chain, so it's naturally async, but we use deterministic security guarantees to ensure the safety of user funds. So when a user is depositing ETH via the Stakehouse Protocol smart contracts, a every deposit, like I say, uh, have said with the um, various talks that uh, as, uh, we've done today, um, every deposit is tracked. So that includes the exact deposit number. We y y the exact deposit number, right? So um, if you're the f you know setting up the fiftieth validator, your deposit is number fifty, right? And there's this deterministic guarantee that the Ethereum Foundation is using to make sure that when it activates a validator on the beacon chain, that it's doing so with uh, deterministic guarantees that the, 
the, the blocks have not been reorged on Ethereum, that uh, the funds actually have been burned in the Ethereum deposit contract before actually activating the validators. So you have this consensus mechanism built on uh, the uh, Ethereum gateway deposit contract, uh, which has this tamper-proof black box Merkle tree, this, they have the sparse Merkle tree that cryptographically um, injects the deposit in such a way that the beacon chain can val validate and verify consensus. And we, we operate on these secure, robust, they're called like World War Three resistant guarantees. So from a Sotora and smart contract point of view, I'll wrap up in a second, is, is making sure that the contract is capturing the correct data points when a user is setting up a validator, depositing, burning their tokens, Etc. So we use these deterministic. We don't, you know, it's 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 deterministically from that. So if there is a number, when we need to be equal to one, some point, right? Yeah, there will be a replication of the third. Yeah. Let's say it's third. Yeah. And it's been made by the And this amount of data has been transferred to the third gateway to be right, which is a vector for them. And that can never be changed. No. Right. And if that needs Absolutely. So, um, yeah, that wraps up my talk. Uh, thank you for listening. Do you? Uh, any, does anyone have any questions before Ethereum come over and uh, and uh, talk about what they're working on? No. Thanks, guys.